it is a real honor to be part of this panel. Um, I am going to be just talking about uh, the Bay Area data, to give you sort of a snapshot of uh, 1970s San Francisco. I will say, I know a lot of you know some of the, a lot of this perhaps, um, but I, um, I know that not everyone does, so um, forgive me if there's stuff that you know that you'll hear from me again. I'll, I'm also going to talk just briefly about punk zines because we have an expert here. Um, I do think that uh, history is important now, especially to be in touch with. I am not an artist, but I am a historian and I um, am fascinated by artists, so. Um, all right, so some images of 1970s San Francisco. Um, the group I'm gonna focus on is the Bay Area Dadaist. Um, you know some of these names, perhaps, Bill Picasso Gaglioni, Tim Mancusi, Charles Chickadell, Irene Dogmatic, Anna Banana, and there were others. They all met up in San Francisco in uh, the 60s and 70s. Uh, this was obviously a complex transitional time um, when the hippie era was peaking and um, there were more cynical currents arising um, more and more. Gaglioni, who had come from New York, talked about how they adjusted to being on the West Coast. He said, we sort of goofed on hippie culture, though our hair was long and we smoked dope, I too. I guess we were cynical because we were from back east. They found bohemia, they found affordable living, they found urban density, and they stayed. Uh, Mancusi said there was a convergence of creative energy in a place and time that discouraged limitations. They put on uh, performances, and um, on the left is their performance of being the Dada brothers, where they marched as Da Da in the Columbus Day Parade in 75. They put on their version of Tristan Zara's play, Gas Heart. They also, um, uh, put on the pink dot caper, which involved um, a bunch of them worked at Barron's Art Supply Store. And John Held um, has written about this um, a little bit. Um, they uh, took these pink dots that they had um, that were extra at Barron's Art Store and um, had their friends just put them all over the city. So the city was covered with pink dots. Um, it's one of their, their pranks. They also made zines. Um, from about 1970 to 1978. It's the Correspondence School, Weekly Breeder, the West Bay Dadaist, later Quo's, Dada Zine, the Banana Rag, Vile, Punks, there were, there were many others. They looked to uh, many different sources in making these. Um, they were looking to fluxus and mail art, um, and they were also looking to the history of uh, California, and more specifically also uh, San Francisco publications. Um, and you probably uh, know some of these, Beatitude, uh, the Oracle, uh, a Mojo Nav Navigator, a, uh, a rock zine put out by David Harris and Greg Shaw, and then Semina, um, which is also in LA. Um, they chose, the Dada, Bay Area Dadaists chose zines, and I think we all know what zines are, but it's kind of uh, interesting to look at the history of them. Here are some historical ones from the 30s and 40s. They date back about that far. Um, they can be uh, defined as underground, amateur, uh, non-commercial, small circulation, uh, short-lived, usually put, about, put out by one or two individuals, uh, usually associated, of course, with countercultural goals, but any topic, really, science fiction, politics, religion, travel, music, anything that one person or two people um, are interested in. They're distributed. Um, in, amongst interest, uh, interested parties. They're distributed through the mail or sold at a nominal cost. They're not for profit. Um, and of course, in the 60s and 70s, with the rise of more uh, easily accessible and affordable print technology, like offset printing and xerography, um, more and more zines, uh, zines became more popular. Punk zines are by far the most famous, I think. The Dada zines, um, came out in print runs of about 50 to 300 at a time. And they were sold um, at small stores uh, like City Lights Books, um, like La Mamelle Center, um, also Bound Together Books. And they were also mailed internationally. I thought looking at one of the, the zines, the New York Correspondence Weekly School Weekly Breeder, uh, and the history of it might help explain um, some of the origin of how they got into zines. 
This publication began in 71 as a one-page flyer put out by the California-based Fluxus West director, uh, Ken Friedman. He handed it to Stu Horn in Cherry Hill, New Jersey in 72. After one issue, one issue it went back to Mancusi in San Francisco, and they put out um, a number of issues. The first issue was two pages stapled together, kind of like a, a newsletter, but then they stapled, uh, they put two staples on either side, and he, made, he thought that was, made a big difference. The staples, he said, were significant because now it was becoming a zine. And Ken, uh, Ken Friedman said that starting with its modest single sheet beginnings, um, that it grew to spark the phenomenon in publishing known as data zines. Um, and I'll just let you look at this, uh, these, these pages. They're full of newspaper cutouts, um, magazine cutouts, really um, anything maybe that they've found on the street, um, and lots of references to Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. Um, so there's this cut and paste aesthetic that you see in these, and um, using all of these different kinds of materials, usually from the Bay Area Dadaists themselves. One of my favorite pages is this one here on the right, showing Nixon and Hoover, and um, it, the caption reads, everybody in here but you and me is queer, and I'm not so sure about you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and on the bottom, Andy Warhol, Alice Cooper, and uh, the Capitoline Wolf, um, all kind of just juxtaposed together, and the reader is left to think about what those things might mean together. Um, I came to these magazines through my interest in data journals and my research on data journals. Uh, I think one of the most interesting parts of the data zines is how they do quote from data magazines. That's something that, that does make them stand out. Uh, they took reproductions from Motherwell's book, um, Data Painters and Poets. They cut out those reproductions and they put them on their pages. Uh, this page here on the left is, has the most examples of that. Uh, they cut out this uh, Man Ray's Data photo um, and put it there. They cut out um, Data Triumphs from Der Data 2 uh, and put that there. Um, and then also using the, the, uh, this flyer, uh, from Francis Picabia from Funny Guy, but in putting in Mancusi's name. And then this, a really obscure cut, um, this is from, um, from a, an exhibition catalog in Cologne, which maybe you've heard about that exhibition catalog, or that exhibition, but this is the catalog there, and they, they excerpt that, all put in with um, different excerpts from you know, Blondie the comic and other um, contemporary references. Uh, they also even imitated whole pages. Uh, it's, this might honestly be a coincidence, but it's a striking similarity. This is a deluxe version of Data 4.5 on the left um, by Tristan Zara from 1919. And on the right is this kind of bizarre cover where um, Gaglioni is, uh, has Data shaved out of his hair, holding a picture of a man who has Data made out of hair on his chest. Um, and it says, imitation Gaglioni. It's sort of this... Uh, sort of a narcissistic, almost homoerotic coupling of the two images that does also kind of bring up interesting links between uh, printing and performance, I think. And then, of course, both of them have them over these classifieds, which at the time would have been even more uh, striking, I think, for um, their, the first readers. And in Data 4 or 5's case, it's actually the classifieds. Another data reference, the special neo merits issue. I can, uh, believe me, there is nothing about merits inside, not surprisingly, um, but you know, they were just full of just references. Um, and of course, at this time, there was, punk was, uh, was uh, becoming more and more well known in, in San Francisco. Um, uh, and there were, of course, many um, bands at the time, the nuns, the Avengers, crime, the mutants. Negative trend, dead Kennedys, et cetera, et cetera. And these, were, these are photographs, um, some by Bruce Conner, of, um, of these bands. And then, of course, the zines. Um, Punk Globe, Damage, Search and Destroy, Cyclone, um, all zines documenting uh, um, the, the scene and doing a lot more than that as well, as I'm sure we'll hear. Of course, the punks were interested in uh, data. I'm not going to talk very much about that, but I just want to just point out uh, you know, this is just for example, uh, an article references Cabaret Voltaire um, and then also talks about the similarities between black humor in punk and in Dada. 
Um, I think people in this room know, uh, I know people in this room know more about this than I, but uh, from all accounts, from everyone I've talked to, including um, Bivail, about uh, the scene in San Francisco, it was encouraging, it was cross-fertilizing, it was intimate. Uh, and this is, of course, um, the, the MAB, and um, uh, people were meeting there, they were, um, they were talking, they were sharing ideas, and um, the zines reflect that to a certain extent. Um, there are some overlaps between them. I would like to posit the idea that the zine served as a kind of stage, if you will, a medium that many different people, different people who are interested um, in, say, um, different aspects of art could come together or could make zines. It was a platform that many people could, uh, could uh, take on. Uh, I'm showing you on the left um, a cover of Flesh Art or Quo's. The titles change a lot. Um, it's actually the last issue of the West Bay Dadaist um, with someone holding a picture of Gaglioni where it says punk art. Punk's uh, a zine they put together in one day. They wanted to see how quickly they could put together one zine and they did it. Um, of course, uh, Irene Dogmatic, whose um, collection is upstairs, uh, she's um, an important um, link, I think, between these two. Uh, an issue of Search and Destroy includes a uh, mail art page that highlights Irene Dogmatic, who, of course, performed in punk bands and um, edited a lot of zines, um, and including Dogarithms and this one, Insult. Um, I thought the, the similarities between these were striking, um, and I think it's also maybe points to the fact that the zines, again, were this venue where people could, in a way, communicate, could meet, if you will, where they developed a lot of the strategies that are common to both groups um, and a lot of the ideas that are in the magazines um, um, where it became defining aspects of both groups. Gaglioni uh, said to me, it was almost like a rave. You do it and then it disappears, talking about making these zines. Um, and a lot of these magazines have disappeared. Um, Mancusi said that they're sleeping in landfills. Um, there are some still in existence, of course, and zines are still around today, and I actually wonder if we're going to see uh, a renaissance of zines now after this week's events. Um, I think people still want to... Um, to have these objects, I think people are attracted to the materiality of them. They do, uh, of course, the internet has, um, is a venue for people looking for connections um, that, that the zines were trying to accomplish as well, but there's something about making this object, the materiality of it, and also reaching different audiences, maybe even people who don't have access to the internet. Um, and I also just want to emphasize the importance of that local scene. I think that it's the emphasis on this immediate community that catalyzed the explosion of zines in San Francisco in the 70s, and I think it really continues to inspire people today. So thank you. <laughs>